to our speaker, John Greenwood, who is going to give us quite a comprehensive, I've had a look at the, uh, the presentation and, it, and it, uh, it really is answering lots of the questions that, uh, that I suppose many people uh, have an interest in knowing. Uh, what makes QE work? Does it work at all? Um, so looking at some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the examples from around the world of that with a particular focus on the Eurozone uh, and, and Japan. Uh, so John has been chief economist uh, with Invesco for, for many years, spent a lot of, about half of your career in, in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you probably know, Invesco is a very wide-ranging uh, uh, wealth management firm uh, based in 20 countries, in, including, including here in Ireland. Including Dublin. Yeah. So um, we look forward to your, to your talk. Okay, well, thank you, Dan um, and Tim, for all the arrangements. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you. My uh, talk is built around the idea that QEs and the policies taken by the US and I think it's fair to say the UK government before, at least before Brexit, uh, have worked out relatively well. But clearly something isn't working quite so well either uh, in Japan or in the Eurozone. And I've thought long and hard about these issues and gone into a lot of the detail. And I, I want to share some of that with you today. Um, so I'm going to contrast the US and the UK on the one hand with Japan and the Eurozone on the other. But before I get into the nitty gritty, I want to say something about what happens in the aftermath of a debt bubble or credit bubble bursting. And I've created this little diagram, it's not really a model, uh, of typically what happens in, in a bubble and bust. So what we have on the vertical axis is a debt to income ratio. Uh, and what typically happens is that when credit conditions become easy, so put yourself back in 2002, 2003, that sort of period, interest rates were very low and uh, credit was easily available. The private sector, by which I mean households, non-financial corporations and financial entities, borrowed and typically would buy assets. Could be real estate, could be uh, commercial or residential, could be equities, could be commodities, a whole range of assets. But in any case, they would borrow and bid up those asset prices. The rising asset prices often also meant that um, people's uh, net worth increased and they were able to go back to the banks to borrow for more. So there was a fair amount of um, positive feedback in this, in this uh, rise in this ratio. But typically what we see, saw in many countries was the debt ratio rising. And that happens in country after country until something stops it. Either the asset prices get too high. People say, there's no way I'm buying any more tulips at this price. Right? Or the central bank raises interest rates and you have an inverted yield curve so it doesn't make sense to go on buying the assets or credit conditions are tightened, or as in the case of 2008, you have a major accident like the Lehman bankruptcy. And then suddenly everything changes. Behavior changes because asset prices fall, but debt doesn't go away. So people are left in a position of negative equity, which you saw a lot of in this country, and we saw a lot of uh, in the UK in the early 90s. And basically, they then try to reduce their indebtedness, so reduce the debt to income ratio over a period of time. Now, while they're doing that, they cannot spend at the normal rate. They cannot consume at the normal rate, they cannot invest at the normal rate. So, GDP will not grow at the normal rate. So, typically, what you see is initially a recession and then a period of subpar growth. And that's exactly what we've been in through what we've been through these past eight years or so across the developed Western world. Meantime, governments step in trying to counterbalance that.
And they do that by fiscal spending, uh, either financed by borrowing, uh, sometimes financed through central bank means, but nowadays that's res uh, severely restricted. Um, and they do it by means of uh, fiscal explicit fiscal stimulus programs or through automatic stabilizers. And typically because the, the, the economy is growing at a subpar rate, Treasury revenues are down, so the government is running a budget deficit. So if it adds to the deficit with stimulus programs, you see the budget deficit rising. So the government's debt to income ratio rising strongly. And you see this in country after country. Now, the scales are not necessarily the same on the private and public sector. But um, I would say that no country has yet come out of phase two. All countries. Uh, no country has yet fully normalized. And phase three, this is not entirely over until the government has reduced its debt ratio. But of course, governments never repay debt. All they do is run balanced budgets and try to grow the, de the GDP, the denominator here. So gradually over time, this would come down, but not through running budget, def not through running budget, budget surpluses. So that's kind of the theory. And the point I want to make, the point of showing you all, all this, is that during this period, phase two, while this uh, private sector debt ratio is declining, the mindset is, I don't want to borrow. And as I'll show you, people don't want to borrow no matter how low the interest rates become. So during this period, there's a complete lack of demand for funds. We live, but we live in, a in an economy, in economies where credit is created through private sector institutions. So if there is no demand for funds, then credit doesn't grow. You get either a slump in money and credit growth, or you get a contraction in money and credit. And that has very severe consequences. But just to illustrate the point and validate this framework, Here's the data for the United States. In the United States, you can see the long build-up in the debt ratio prior to the Lehman bubble bursting. And then <clears throat> the abrupt deleveraging in the early stages of, of the, the downturn, and more recently, a more gradual reduction in the debt ratio. So the US, I think you could say, conforms to that template that I just showed you. And Actually, the US has done better than any other economy. So that the debt ratio today has come down by some 65, uh, 70 basis points, uh, percentage points, excuse me. And the debt ratio has now returned to roughly where it was in 2002, reversing about two thirds of the build up in leverage, which is pretty good progress. The public sector, on the other hand, that debt ratio remains at its peak. And you can see, you know, one could draw that second vertical line that I had in the previous chart, but I'm not drawing that second vertical line yet because this flattening out of the debt ratio is occurring at a time when interest rates are still incredibly low. And if interest rates were to rise, I suspect there might be more deleveraging by the private sector. So that's kind of the framework. Now let me make a few general propositions before I get into the First, that <clears throat> this, well, let me go back to this chart. This, this vertical line, the first vertical line after phase one, is often known now in the, in the literature as the Minsky moment after the American economist Hyman Minsky. This is the point when behavior changes. Um, and the point is that after the Minsky moment, deleveraging becomes the mindset. Instead of leveraging up and hoping that asset price increases will bail you out. There's a complete change of psychology and all people want to do is to repay debt or to at least to restore a positive equity position. Now that deleveraging has blocked credit and money growth, slowing nominal and real GDP. Now my proposition is that QE can solve that problem, i.e. it can create money independently of the banking system. Now, creating money 
may not necessarily be achieved in this deleveraging environment simply by lowering rates. And yet what we see is some central banks simply lowering rates and waiting for the banks to lend. But if customers don't want to borrow and banks don't want to lend, then there's no assurance that those very low rates or even negative rates will achieve anything. So what I'm going to show you is how you can do, or how QE done properly can create new money and furthermore can assist in the deleveraging process because the creation of new money comes without increasing private sector leverage. So that's what I'm now going to show you uh, in, a, in a few slides. First though, the general, the orthodox view is to treat QE as a method of not only um, providing funds, but more a way of lowering uh, the yield curve to, um, obviously the, the central bank sets the short term interest rate typically, but purchases of assets, securities, and long term securities by the government by, by, the, by the central bank, excuse me, um, tend to push down the yield curve along, along its length. So the traditional view is that QE helped mainly by lowering interest rates. But if you look at the record, for example, in the United States, each time QE was announced, that's the, the first vertical line in each episode, there was an announcement effect. But once the purchases went into operation, rates rose. And that happened on, on each occasion. There was some decline here, and then a rise in rates. So, it's, and, and if you think about it, I mean, a successful QE program would restore economic growth, would raise the inflation expectations, and therefore you'd expect interest rates to rise anyway. So measuring QE by its impact on interest rates, I don't think is very helpful. More fundamentally, I think that the right way to approach this is to think about QE in the context of what happened in the, in the United States in the 1930s. Now, as you may know, after 1929 and the stock market crash, the volume of money in the United States contracted sharply. In fact, the cumulative decline in M2 between 1929 and 1933 was 38%. The cumulative decline in M1 over the same period was 32%. And the, the decline in lending was even larger. Um, total, total lending by lending to the private sector declined by 54% over the same period. In other words, because of the shock, not only was there a reluctance to, to lend, but there was a determination on both sides to shrink balance sheets. So households and corporate customers reduced their borrowing by paying it back, and banks uh, were forced to shrink their balance sheets as well. So liabilities, which is deposits, shrank, hence the decline in the money supply, and loans also shrank. So we had this disaster in the US to which the Fed did not react. Essentially, the Fed did nothing until after 1933. Now, the problem in 2008, in a sense, was to avoid this. How to prevent this from happening again? Uh, and I think that uh, we can see that very clearly in the data for US bank lending. Here's total bank lending by commercial banks in the United States uh, in 2008, where this chart starts. And you can see it was growing at a pretty healthy rate, 10 to 13% per annum. But then after the Lehman uh, episode, prior to that, there'd been the Bear Stearns bankruptcy as well, but lending then plunged and contracted. And over the entire period, from the middle of or September 2008 to 2011, the cumulative decline in bank lending was about 14%. So if you like, roughly half of a decline in the money stock in the 1930s. In other words, if, so what that means is if 
if the authorities had done nothing this time around, we would have had a slump at least half that severe. Now, what happened in the 1930s was there was a huge contraction in GDP. Unemployment went to uh, somewhere in the mid 20s, 20 to 25%. Um, and of course, there was deflation as well. So, huge uh, impact on society, um, misery, uh, because this was not prevented. This time, however, through the Fed's QE and the Bank of England's QE, that effectively was prevented. And this is how it was done in the US. Um, what I've done here is uh, highlight these episodes of QE. And, but instead of looking at the amount of securities purchased by the Fed, I'm looking at the rate of change of banks' reserves and their contribution to the money supply uh, on the other side of banks' balance sheets. If you want to get into the detail, I'm very happy to explain it, but basically what you do is you take the stock of money and explain its growth rate by the growth of the assets on the other side of the balance sheet plus any residual items. And I've uh, reduced those to three groups. So we've got the broad money supply, which is the black line in the background, which, which is uh, shaded. And then the three main contributory items. First of all, there's the lending, which you just saw, contracted sharply. Now, if the money supply had followed bank lending, there would have been a sharp decline. But that didn't happen because the Fed stepped in, injected reserves, which counterbalanced in terms of uh, the bank's balance sheets. It prevented uh, the, uh, the assets from shrinking. And the counterpart on the other side was that the deposits were also able to continue to grow. Now, they did, they did slow down quite a lot for a while, uh, but the Fed's QE was able to prevent that complete contraction. So there were three episodes of QE, as you know, uh, QE1, QE2, QE3, and each time you get this sort of surge of growth of bank reserves. These are actually not growth rates, these are contributions to the rate of change of money. So if you add up the, Q, the, these, the blue, the red, and the green line, uh, the net result gives you the black line. <coughs> anyway, you can see that um, while lending was very weak, uh, QE prevented a complete collapse of the money supply in episode one. In episode two, lending was still very weak and the injection of funds enabled the money growth to pick up a bit. And again, again in QE3, um, lending was still very, very weak, didn't really pick up until the beginning of 2014. And then again, um, the injection of new funds enabled money growth to continue. And today what we have is our QE is obviously terminated in the US, so this is now um, negative or zero. And what's happening is banks are once again lending, and you can see that we have a, a normal situation in the banking system. That is that bank lending is roughly the equivalent of the growth of bank deposits on money supply. So the black line and the red line are in line together. So there's a, a sort of template, if you like, of how to do M, how to do QE and get it to work so that you don't have a monetary disaster uh, as we saw in the 1930s. Now from that I've derived two basic rules uh, for successful QE programs. The first is to buy the securities from non-banks. Now I haven't really emphasized the detail of that yet, but I'll come to that in just a second. And the other thing to do is to buy long-term securities, not short-term securities, because if the central bank buys short-term securities, it's clearly going to have, have those rolling off its balance sheet, maturing, and then it's going to have to replace them. And that's going to dilute the effectiveness of its program. So let me deal with the first one first. Um, well, no, I've got one other thing to say before that. Uh, when the ECB announced its QE program, uh, in January of last year, January 2015, 
they said that they would be buying 60 billion euros a month. Uh, and I think the initial program was going to last until um, March of this year. And then, it, and then, it was next, and then subsequently it's been extended, and this number has been increased to 80 billion. No matter. So what I did was to apply the principles I'd been observing in the US and calculate what that would mean if the program was successfully implemented, what that would mean for the rate of growth of the stock of money in the Eurozone. And this is the spreadsheet I put together, the chart from the spreadsheet, compiled in January 2015. I haven't changed it since then. But the ECB balance sheet was going to do that, growing at roughly 30% per annum. And broad money, M3, in the Eurozone would, be, would grow from very low rates of growth. Uh, actually, uh, it was already growing at 4 or 5% here on the right-hand scale. Uh, but it would end up growing at about 10% per annum. But in fact, that hasn't happened at all. Money growth has been much lower than that, only about 5% per annum. And lending, of course, has hardly picked up at all. So the question is, you know, what's different? And this is really what triggered the analysis that I've been doing. Now, in the case of the Fed and the Bank of England, the Fed bought long-dated US Treasuries and a small amount of T-bills, which it later reversed with that um, maturity extension operation or, or um, uh, operation twist, as it's sometimes called. And they also bought mortgage-backed securities. The vast majority of these securities were purchased from non-banks. Similarly with the Bank of England, they bought long-dated gilts, some commercial paper, but almost entirely from non-banks. But if you look at the QE programs of the Bank of Japan and the ECB, most of the purchases have been from banks. The Bank of Japan has bought a small amount from non-banks, ETFs, JREITs, uh, but also, uh, starting in June, uh, the ECB has been starting to buy corporate bonds, which, again, it is buying from non-banks. But the vast bulk of the purchases of government securities have been uh, from banks. Now, what's the difference? Why does it matter? And this is my analysis. So here's how the Fed and the Bank of England were doing it. When they bought government securities, they added to their assets and they purchased the government securities from non-banks. So here we've got the balance sheets of banks, bank, sorry, central banks, banks, and non-banks. Assets on the left, liabilities on the right, the American Convention. Um, so step number one, the central bank buys government securities from non-banks. You could use mortgage-backed securities, it doesn't matter, the result would be the same. In exchange, the seller, which could be an insurance company, a pension fund, a money manager, obtains a check, essentially. Nowadays it's electronic payment, but it's a check from the central bank, which the seller lodges with its bank. So the seller now has a new deposit and the commercial bank essentially completes that process by taking the deposit of the draft to the central bank, which is credited to the re reserve account of the commercial bank. So we now have an increase in reserve deposits of commercial banks held at the central bank. So the net result is central bank balance sheets, the central bank's balance sheet has expanded, commercial bank's balance sheets have also expanded, but on the books of the non-bank public, this is households, firms, and non-bank financial institutions, they now have more money, but less government securities. If we fill in the remainder of the, some of the assets and liabilities of the commercial banks and the, uh, the non-banks, what you can see is that the money supply which consists of banknotes and coin plus deposits held by the non-banks have increased. So this method of, of implementing QE uh, incontrovertibly increases the stock of money. Now, of course, it's possible that non-banks may be repaying debt. Uh, 
And so they're burning up these deposits by repaying loans that they've previously drawn down. But this would nevertheless be a substantial increase in the rate of growth of deposits in the system compared with what otherwise would have happened. So the, the other thing to point out about this set of transactions is that deposits have increased without loans growing. The counterpart asset to the deposits is new reserves for banks at the central bank. The fact that loans have not grown means that those loans which are, are reflected here as borrowing liabilities of the non-bank public enables or assists in the deleveraging process. It means that instead of creating deposits by making new loans, banks have had its, an injection of funds into their balance sheets uh, and, as I say, the money supply has increased without any increase in loans and therefore in leveraging the private sector. So this kind of QE assists in that deleveraging process that I talked about at the beginning. Now let's look at what's happened in the Eurozone and in Japan. Here again we've got the same balance sheets that central bank, commercial banks and the non-bank public. And initially what happens is that the central bank typically is buying securities, government securities, from banks. The banks in exchange receive a draft of payment from the central bank and that's credited to their reserve accounts. So on the books of the central bank there's no difference. Both sides of the balance sheet have expanded by equal amounts. But on the books of the banks they now have reserve deposits where they previously had government securities. But if we fill in the rest of the items on the balance sheets of the commercial banks and the, and the non-bank public, you can see that there has been no impact whatsoever on the money supply at this level. The money supply, to remind you again, is banknotes and coin plus deposits held by non-banks so there's no liquefaction, no injection of liquidity into the real economy, if you like. This is the real economy, this is the financial sector, or the banking part of the financial sector. That's why I call this an asset swap. Essentially what's happened is that the central bank has swapped assets with, with the banks, but there's been no impact at this level. And that, I think, is the fundamental explanation of why money growth in Japan and the Eurozone has not been as rapid as it otherwise should have been. In addition, let me highlight again that if at this point the commercial banks wanted to increase deposits or policymakers wanted money to grow, what would have to happen is that the commercial banks would have to make loans to increase deposits here. And that, of course, would add to leverage in the private sector. Or at least it would prevent leverage from coming down. So this process is not only not liquidity enhancing, it's detrimental to or discouraging to the whole deleveraging process. And what an economy needs after a debt crisis is balance sheet repair and reliquification. Re and this, uh, this approach to QE is not generating those results. So what's the evidence for this? Here's the data. <laughs> this is the, uh, what I've done is I've taken the consolidated data for uh, commercial banks in the Eurozone. So that's all the countries of, of the, uh, the Euro area. <coughs> These are securities they held in trillions of euros uh, on the uh, left-hand scale. No, sorry, right-hand scale. This scale is for the central bank. This scale is for the, uh, the commercial banks. So, euro area banks were holding roughly 3.1 trillion euros worth of securities as at March 2015. 
with the start of the ECB's QE program, look what's happened to their holdings of securities. In the meantime, of course, the ECB's holdings of securities have gone up a lot. Now, these two sets of numbers don't quite match because actually what's happening uh, is that the banks are consistently buying securities in the open market, replenishing their, um, their, uh, their magazines, if you like, uh, and then selling the securities back to the central bank. Now, they may be securing those from the, by buying them. They may be buying them in the market from the public, or uh, they may be buying them at new auctions. Uh, but there are, uh, either way, um, this all I can tell from the data is I've got the absolute level of holdings. But I suspect that this number is a, the, the gross sales of securities by commercial banks is a lot higher than this number over the period. After all. The ECB, over this particular period, had bought 723 billion euros worth of securities, but the headline number of securities held by banks had only gone down by 287 billion. But as I said, they've been replenishing their, their stocks. So um, it's clear that the ECB was buying, has been buying from the banks. And as I say in the title, the ECB has purchased at least 40%, that's this number as a fraction of that, from other banks. Incidentally, the same thing has been happening in Japan. Here's the Bank of Japan holdings of securities on the left-hand scale. Um, and here's the bank's holdings of securities going down, again, by a smaller amount, but in this case, roughly 30% of estimated purchases just at the headline level. Again, I can't get the gross sales figures uh, by the banks. So clearly, you know, the operation is different. Now in Europe, that's been justified by saying, well, but we are a bank-based financial system. Um, we don't rely like the Americans do on the capital markets. I think that's an excuse. I, I don't think it's a valid reason. Um, there are plenty of securities held by non-banks and arrangements could be made to, to purchase those securities. More broadly, I think Europe has quite a big problem in that banks have not yet started to expand their balance sheets. Here we see Italy. Total assets of you Italian banks still declining and their holdings of securities declining quite rapidly. It's a similar story for Spain uh, although the Spanish economy is recovering, Spanish total bank assets are declining, loans are declining, and holdings of securities are declining. So across the board, we're seeing zero growth or even contractions in the individual country's uh, bank assets. That's not desirable from the point of view of fostering a recovery. Uh, I think that the, even, even the, the other part of the ECB's program, the LTRO program, was not very successful. Um, the, the ECB increased, uh, it, it, it enabled, it, it made loans to banks uh, through the LTRO pro program starting in late 2011, soon after Mario Draghi became president. So the ECB's balance sheet expanded then from 2 trillion euros to just over 3 trillion euros. But at the same time, this was lending to banks against collateral, but at the same time, total lending by banks declined from roughly 3% year or 4% year on year to about minus 4%. I really don't think you could call that much of a success. Uh, it was accompanied by a shrinkage of banks' balance sheets. And essentially, it's the same problem, that the, the ECB was making cheaper funds available to the banks. The banks were substituting uh, loans uh, to existing borrowers with funding from the central bank, uh, but overall they were contracting their balance sheet. And I suspect the same will happen with the new targeted LTRO program. 
Um, a little bit more specifically, these are the Japanese bank holdings of securities that I talked about earlier. You can see how they've come down very sharply since uh, Mr. Kuroda's uh, scheme was started. Japan, of course, has done two episodes of QE. It did QE in the early 2000s. There was a brief period here uh, after the Lehman bankruptcy under Shirakawa, Shirakawa when they did a very half-hearted sort of QE, but they didn't really start in earnest until Governor Kuroda was appointed uh, in April 2013, and since then we've had a very expansionary Bank of Japan balance sheet. Uh, financed in the same way, largely by purchases of government security, and they have also made the other mistake uh, so instead of buying from non-banks, they were buying from banks, but in addition, they were purchasing not only government securities, the black part of the, these bars, the Bank of Japan was also purchasing short-term securities, so-called tegata, or financing bills, that's the red part. So those were continuously maturing and running off the balance sheet. The net result for Japan is that although the monetary base, or... Uh, the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan, essentially, has expanded massively uh, from an index level of 100 to over 300. There's been barely any growth at all in money or bank lending. And I can show you that in a more conventional way. These are the rates of change of uh, money in black and bank lending uh, in red. You can see that during Japan's bubble in the late 1980s, we had double-digit growth of money and credit. When the bubble burst, they had that big change in behavior. Nobody wanted to borrow, banks didn't want to lend, and lending and uh, money growth collapsed. And since then, they've been in this prolonged period of very slow growth of money and credit, and that's the primary explanation, explanation for their, uh, their deflation. And even you know, this very aggressive QE hasn't really worked very well uh, because, as I say, the Bank of Japan essentially made both mistakes. It bought securities from the banks and it also bought short-term securities. And this is uh, what, what's been happening on the books of Japanese banks more generally. So under QE1, uh, total... Um, their holdings of securities increased, their, lend, loan, lend, their loans declined. Net result was that their holding of total bank credit, which is the sum of these two, declined. And the same roughly, well, though it's slightly it's reversed, basically this time securities have been declining, lending has been growing just a little bit, but the net result is that bank credit has been declining. So all in all, it has not been a very happy tale. So, what's behind all this and what's the problem? Now, the normal kind of interpretation is that monetary policy works through interest rates. Uh, but more specifically, QE sh should work primarily through, well, that, that's the interest rates is a direct pass through effect, lower interest rates. Uh, but as I pointed out, that doesn't always happen. Um, but more specifically through portfolio rebalancing effects. That is, after the stock of money is increased, then the institutions that acquire those deposits are likely to reinvest them in equities, corporate bonds, real estate, and so on. And that triggers that portfolio rebalancing effect. Of course, it pushes up asset prices, uh, but that in turn induce, should induce some increase in spending. And given that... You know, QE purchases from non-banks helps with deleveraging, uh, then there should be some good results. However, if you look at the Bank of Japan's analysis, and this comes from one of their bulletins in May last year, it's their diagram. <coughs> All of the emphasis is on interest rates. Their view of the mechanism of Q QQE, as they call it, qualitative and quantitative easing, uh, is that purchases of JGBs, Japanese government bonds, would lower nominal interest rates. Um, the announcement effects would reduce inflation expectations, uh, or raise them, sorry, in this case. Um, and then um, the net result would be lower real interest rates 
which would encourage borrowing and spending. That's, so, so it's all interest rates. No real, no mention here of the stock of money, the quantity of, of, of lending, etc. Um, in a broad sense, what has happened, to, to conclude my talk, is that the central banks in the Eurozone and in Japan have relied on a transmission mechanism for money and credit through the banking system. But the problem is that that transmission mechanism is broken. Banks are reluctant to lend because they're repairing their balance sheets, building up capital, improving the quality of their, 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 loan, their loan portfolios, etc. And on the other side, households and firms have been reluctant to borrow. So the, trans the standard transmission mechanism isn't working. So the solution that I'm advocating is that the QE program should be redesigned so that it bypasses or circumvents the banks. If the central bank were to buy securities from non-banks, then that will directly create money in the way that I've described and that would boost the amount of purchasing power or spending power in the economy. So, design of QE is really important. Uh, the Bank of Japan's QE program in 2001-06 failed, and similarly the ECB's LTRO program uh, and its QE program has so far been disappointing. As a result, we've only got, at best, growth rates in these two areas, the Japan and the Eurozone, of one, one and a half. Of course, individual countries like Spain and Ireland grow much more rapidly. But uh, for the Eurozone as a whole, where there's been almost no deleveraging in Italy or France, for the, the, the Eurozone as a whole, um, the results have been disappointing. By contrast, the Fed and the Bank of England asset purchases, I think, were largely successful because they focused on long-term assets and they, acqu they acquired these securities from non-banks. That directly injected new deposits into the financial system and that has helped support not only <coughs> purchasing power, but it has also helped support the deleveraging process. So that's my thesis. Um, I'm sure some of you will have other opinions, but I'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you.